you have been you know letting the hyperledger project for a while so can you just tell us the update what's going on in since you joined and where we are yeah. now Sure. Well, I joined Hyperledger about six months after it started, and I've been there now for just over two years. And uh, Hyper the the project has grown in uh, in, a, in a way that mirrors a lot of the growth of the blockchain industry. Right. Uh, I mean, when we started, all of the excitement was around Bitcoin. Was around. I mean, Ethereum was just launching at the same time. This was 2015, December 2015, when it was announced. Uh, but there are a lot of people saying there's more to this than just um, spending money and moving money around. Could we use this as a way to reestablish how trust works on the internet? Internet and and try to decentralize a lot of things that today with led to being centralized it might be okay to be centralized if you're talking about a ride hailing application or you're talking about a social network right uh, but if you're talking about a banking network if you're talking about supply chains you might not want to be so centralized so uh, the blockchain industry has grown and at hyperledger we realized pretty early we needed to be a home for a lot of different ways to build a blockchain it wasn't going to be like the Linux kernel project with one singular architecture it was going to be a couple of different ones and let's explore and see what happens. Does this look like MySQL and Cassandra and Redis? Uh, or does, is there really just one logical architecture? Now at Hyperledger, we have um, 10 different technology projects. Um, five of those are what we call frameworks. These are software that a bank would run or a company would run to participate in a, in a blockchain project in a distributed ledger with a bunch of other organizations they want to do business with. Two of those are now production quality. Hyperledger Fabric, uh, which is uh, uh, kind of the basis for a lot of IBM's work, uh, Oracle, Huawei, uh, th they've all hosted kind of blockchain as a service offerings. Uh, a lot of companies now provide products and services on top of this, as well as Hyperledger Sawtooth, which is a pretty novel approach. It's one that borrows even a little bit more of its kind of DNA from the kind of the cryptocurrency community. Um, uh, and that has been led by Intel, but now there's a bunch of companies behind that as well. And these two platforms now drive about 40 production networks that we see out there and about 60 different uh, vendors and, and hosts and, and other companies building on top of it. So one way we've grown is by growing the commercial ecosystem around this code uh, and that's also led to lots of pilots and proofs of concept and as I said about 40 different production networks. Um, those, the other eight projects at Hyperledger, uh, some of them are other frameworks so Hyperledger Indie very much focused on digital identity which has been a very hot topic for us. Everyone's asking what's next after Aadhaar or Right, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, India system in India to track digital identity. Uh, what's next uh, when it comes to e-passports and those sorts of things? And how do we do that in a way that doesn't create privacy uh, concerns uh, or meets concerns of the GDPR, for example? Um, uh, and so Indy is very hot, and we're starting to say even here in the government of uh, British Columbia, uh, there's a pilot involving uh, business registrations using Hyperledger Indy. Um, the other one I'll mention is Hyperledger Burrow, which is an implementation of the Ethereum smart contract language called Solidity. It's a way to run Solidity smart contracts, both standalone on, a, on its own kind of blockchain or on top of Sawtooth and now on top of Fabric. So lots of interesting mixing, lots of interesting kind of uh, brownie in motion of good mm -hmm. ideas coming in. Um, and the idea is to take this and put it down a kind of a conveyor belt to production software that people can use to actually build uh, uh, real blockchain systems. They don't have to wait for someday, you know, uh, something's going to solidify. Uh, uh, and we're all uh, non-cryptocurrency, non-ICO uh, kind of oriented. Um, but I, it, I like to call, call it token agnostic at this okay. point. Uh, and so as awareness has grown and people have really started to deploy, we've also seen lots of new users come in, contributors. We have over 600 different uh, uh, people who've contributed software in one form or another, like a patch, or for many people, it's their full-time job now. Uh, and finally, I'll mention we have uh, put, we put up some free training materials on edX, uh, courses that have now been uh, started by mm -hmm. over 100,000 different people uh, registering for and starting the, down the learning curve. Uh, and we're about to launch uh, training and certification for uh, Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Sawtooth uh, to really help professionalize kind of the, uh, the, the talent pool that's out there around us. So what are the other use cases that you are also excited about which you did not, you know, kind of, you know, thought about in the beginning? Well, I think for me, the, the biggest the biggest one I didn't anticipate going in that I think is going to be the place we have the biggest impact is on digital identity, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of turning your, your identity being defined by all these things known about you on a remote server, and you have like a name and password to that, right? To instead being about 
uh, data you have locally and claims, things like your passport, things like your healthcare records, things that you hold close to you, and it's something that looks like a wallet, right? Mm -hmm. Something that looks like a, a folder of some sort. And then you decide when to share with somebody else, when to present your passport to a border you know, uh, agent or uh, uh, your history of prescriptions to a doctor that you're seeing while you're on vacation so you can get a prescription. And then knowing who you shared it with and being able to pull that back, no matter what happens on the servers, right? Mm -hmm. No matter, you know, it's not like you have to log into Facebook to share that information, right? Um, uh, this reinvention of digital identity is, uh, goes under the name self-sovereign identity, and Hyperledger Indy is an implementation of that, and it's something we're building in conjunction with a lot of different nonprofits, uh, for-profit companies building that infrastructure, and we're seeing uh, even governments take a, a strong interest in. So that, for me, is like, I know it's not a use case, it's like a, a whole sector, you know, digital identity, but that's going to be perhaps the most impactful kind of change I think we'll see in the, in a, in the next five years from blockchain technology. Are there certain regions of the world where you're seeing adoption of blockchain or hyperledger more than other parts? The interest is in really strong in China. Mm -hmm. um, in mainland China, the Chinese government has actually said this is a top-level priority for us uh, to, to figure out how to make distributed ledgers work uh, uh, and, and, and blockchain technology work as a way to help build auditability to markets, a way to build um, to modernize their their own kind of uh, marketplaces, right? Uh, uh, but also build trust and confidence in a country where that's often either taken for granted or or ignored, right? Um, uh, and so so we have about 20% uh, uh, of our members are based inside China. Companies like Baidu and Tencent and Huawei, and they are actually contributing code, which is great to see. And we have a technical working group focused on uh, communicating in Chinese with developers who are there, getting them involved in the projects, getting bug reports in and improvements and that sort of thing. That's great. Um, uh, and helping cross the great firewall, right, in many ways. Uh, and in the rest of Asia, another 20% of our members are based there. So 40% uh, total of our of our kind of development efforts, of our of our activity is out there, right? Um, uh, but this is also not a Silicon Valley driven type of phenomenon, amazingly. I mean, there's a few Silicon Valley companies involved, but it's um, New York, it's uh, London, it's uh, Singapore, uh, it's, it's incredibly uh, and that's been pretty reassuring because open source is a global phenomenon and really should be about kind of uplifting all regions. So that's been great.